Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Textile Talks. Uh, it's uh, great to scan through the chat and see people from all over the world um, uh, tuning in today for this. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gregory from the International Quilt Museum. Uh, the IQM is pleased to host today's episode of Textile Talks. Um, our sponsors, uh, excuse me, uh, Textile Talks is brought to you by the following organizations who share responsibilities to provide these talks every week. They are the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, the San Jose Mu Museum of Quilts and Textiles, the Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. The Textile Talks is offered free to attendees thanks to these generous sponsors Please, if you would, help us thank these sponsors by patronizing their businesses. These sponsors, beginning at the platinum level, are Moda Fabrics and Supplies and Quilting Daily. The silver level sponsors are eQuilter.com and Aurafil. And our bronze level sponsors are Art Artistic Artifacts, Misty Fuse, Schiffer Publishing, Clover, Nine Patch Fabrics, Exotic Silks, Thai Silks, Empty Spools Seminars, Quilt Mania, and thequiltshow.com. We uh, respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and the other participants today during our program. Just for, as a point of information on how to navigate and make the most of your experience, Please use the question and answer or Q&A tab in the, at the bottom of your screen for questions and use the chat box for greeting others in, who are attending and the survey tab for commentary or ways that we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. We are using a new Zoom feature called Live Captions. We're excited that this will make textile talks accessible to a wider audience. If you prefer not to view captions, you should be able to turn them on and off in the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Thank you and enjoy today's program. The program today is titled Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50, Journey to Japan, and is presented by Marin Hansen. Marin is the International Quilt Museum's curator of international collections and is responsible for building and interpreting the museum's non-Western collection. She earned an MA in Museum Studies and Textile History from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a PhD in Museum Studies from the University of Leicester in the UK. Marin has been a curator at the IQM since 2001 and is co-editor of its collections catalog, American Quilts in the Modern Age, 1870 to 1940. She is project curator of the IQM's World Quilts website and contributor to several of its modules. Marin curated the IQM's exhibition, Abstract Design in American Quilts, Journey to Japan, Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50, Journey to Japan, along with co-curator Nao Nomura, who is associate professor in the Faculty of Liberal Arts at Saitama University in Japan. That exhibition, along with three other exhibitions that form a series, um, are covered in this catalog that we published, also titled Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50, available on our website and through Amazon. So I think that's enough introductions and housekeeping things and I turn it over now to Marin. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction and I am thrilled to be here at Textile Talks. Um, again, my name is Marin Hansen and I am the curator of international collections. I have the privilege of being the curator of international collections at the International Quilt Museum. As Jonathan said, my talk today will be focused on an exhibition that I co-curated with my colleague and friend Nao Nomura um, called Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50, Journey to Japan. 
But as he indicated, it was not the only exhibition in that series. We currently have four exhibitions on view at the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, all of which focus on the exhibition Abstract Design in American Quilts, which was on view at the Whitney Museum of American Art 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago uh, in 1971. So that series of exhibitions uh, includes these four. Uh, the uh, sort of core or the heart of this exhibition series is a reinstallation of those quilts that were at the Whitney in 1971, the Abstract Design in American Quilts at 50 exhibition. Uh, we also feature an exhibition uh, curated by Dr. Sandra Sider, New York Nexus, looking at uh, quilt makers who saw the exhibition at the Whitney 50 years ago and were influenced by it and went on to have illustrious quilt studio quilt careers. Raising the Profile, curated by my colleague Jonathan Gregory, who you just heard from which is uh, looking at the impact of abstract design in American quilts on American DIY um, and on collectors, institutions, uh, what the sort of ripple effects were of that exhibition. So finally, the exhibition I'll be talking about today is Journey to Japan. And um, I just wanted to give you sort of a map an outline of what I'll be talking about today. And these are sort of the highlights or the high points, the contexts that I'll be covering. They include the fact that um, Japan uh, already had a very rich history of needlework traditions um, going back centuries. And I'll be showing you a few examples of uh, items in our collection that illustrate quilting, patchwork, applique. Um, so those needlework traditions really helped um, lay some groundwork for a revival in crafting in Japan in the mid 20th century. I'll talk a little bit about leisure time in Japan because that was important to, um, again, a revived interest in crafting and in quilt making specifically. People had more time to um, spend on leisure activities like crafts. Um, I'll talk a bit about the media coverage that uh, many Japanese people saw that led to a few, uh, several different institutions inviting uh, the curators of abstract design in American quilts to send their quilts to Japan. So that was a big moment um, when these institutions thought, hey, the Whitney Museum in New York City had such great success showing these antique American quilts, maybe we can do the same thing. And then I'll talk specifically about the sort of the core event uh, that is the journey to Japan. And that's the fact that in 1975, 1976, a group of um, quilts that were part of abstract design in American quilts did go to both Tokyo and Kyoto, Japan, as well as a few other cities. Um, so they had a, a, a year-long tour, in essence, of Japan. And then I'll talk about some of the key players, people who were influenced by seeing uh, these quilts in Japan um, and who went on, just like the, the artists in New York Nexus, went on to have very storied careers in quilt making and in, in teaching. So those are that's uh, an outline, an overview of what I'll be sharing with you today. To start with, I did want to set this historical context and make it clear that even though there was a boom in the 1970s of, of American style quilt making, um, there really were, there were needlework traditions already well um, established in Japan. Um, this is an example of a textile called a kesa, and it's a little bit hard to see here because it's all made from the same fabric, but it is actually patchwork. Um, and this is a robe for a Buddhist priest. It would have been worn during a, a special ceremony. This is a seven um, strip uh, kesa. So there are actually seven patchwork strips in there. If you look very closely, you can maybe see where some of those uh, brocaded fabric patterns don't quite align properly. Um, so this seven strip kesa um, would have been for a formal occasion, but there were other kessas with even more patchwork strips that would have been progressive for progressively more important um, 
religious occasions. So this is a an early 19th century or first half of the 19th century example of a kesa, and it's uh, likely Japanese. But this garment in general um, originated in India as a kasaya, as it's called there. Um, it also then went to China, obviously along with the spread of Buddhism. Um, and it was called a jiaxia there. And here are a, a few examples of paintings and scrolls that show, well, on the left is the Buddha wearing one of these kasaya or jiaxia or kesa, these patchwork robes. And then on the right is a scroll um, from the Palace Museum in Taiwan. So it's a Chinese version of, I believe, some, some Buddhist um, monks who are wearing some of these patchwork garments. The patchwork really was seen as an expression of humility and poverty, um, which was a little bit ironic because a lot of the kesa were actually constructed using really fine, fine silks that were donated by wealthy patrons of the temples. So even though the patchwork was intended to communicate um, poverty and humility, uh, asceticism, they were really quite um, beautiful and um, sort of luscious <laughs> fabrics that would have been very expensive uh, for the priests to have purchased on their own. So uh, there's just a little bit of an irony embedded in there. Now, the patchwork did retain some of its more uh, humble uh, connotations in objects like these two komibukuro, which are rice bags. Um, so they would have carried, people would have carried rice in them um, to, as offerings when they were going to uh, the temple, or um, they were sometimes used also as just carriers for gifts or to go visiting. But you can see these are, again, made of patchwork. The one on the left is a bit older. It's from the Edo period. Um, so probably, you know, maybe first half of the 19th century, something like that. And the one on the right is from the Meiji period, late 19th, maybe early 20th century. Um, but just some really gorgeous fabrics on the left, more sort of your brocaded um, and embroidered uh, with, with metallic thread fabrics. And then on the right, some really great examples of um, indigo dyed fabrics using a variety of very common techniques in Japan. Patchwork was also sometimes used um, for under kimono or juban. This is a han juban, a half under kimono. So it was worn underneath the main kimono, kimono that um, someone would have been wearing. And I love this one because it, um, it has some aesthetic similarities to Western or American style crazy quilts, sort of roughly from the same period. This is maybe a little bit earlier, but we do know that crazy quilts were influenced at least to a certain extent by Japanese art and folk art and crafts, the aesthetic of Japanese folk art. So um, I love the crazy-esque um, aesthetic to this piece. Um, Edo, as Tokyo was called in the 19th century or you know pre pre 20th century, Edo was uh, prone to fires. A lot of the the housing stock in Edo was made of wood and paper, and so fires were extremely common. And localized fire brigades formed to help battle these fires. And so a garment that came out of those efforts uh, were these firefighters' coats. Um, and it's a little hard to see, but you can probably appreciate that there are, are there's some very dense stitching happening here. Sashiko stitching, just a plain running stitch, but it's quilting, holding all these layers together. And this is um, a robe that a firefighter would have worn, and then also the helmet on the, the bottom right there. And they would have soaked these with water before they went in to fight a fire. So this was early, yeah, early firefighting gear, and often. Um, each brigade would have their own symbols uh, dyed onto the reverse of their jacket or sometimes on the inside as well. So there, this is a really great example of quilting in historic Japanese textiles. Um, a garment or a type of textile you may be familiar with is boro. Uh, this is a boro garment on the left. Uh, this was a technique uh, whereby a, a garment or some other um, domestic 
or household textile would have been repeatedly patched um, until the original surface became almost completely obscured. So it was patch upon patch upon patch. And again, it's using just that plain running stitch, the sashiko stitch uh, to hold all of those layers down. And the, the surface, I have a detail here. It's not actually of the garment uh, shown there. It's from a futon cover, but you can see um, how many layers of fabrics end up being layered uh, on top of each other. And you it ends up creating a very, very textured uh, surface. So those are, um, as I said, that's sort of setting the stage for what I'm going to be talking about later, just showing that uh, quilting applique patchwork. These were all techniques that were uh, common in, in one form or another in Japan already. Now, moving into the 20th century, um, after Japan was on the losing side in World War II, after they lost in World War II, there was, of course, the Allied occupation of Japan, and that was between 1945 and 1952. Um, it was an Allied op occupation, but really it was American-led. Um, and so during those periods, Japan was was suffered economically, um, but the, the American um, temporary government really uh, tried to help get the, the Japanese economy back sort of on its feet. And, by the uh, 1950s and 1960s, the Japanese economy really had, had rebounded and it had sort of re, and the Japanese had reinvented their economy. There was rapid manufacturing growth. Um, and so uh, consumer electronics, as you can see on the left, a whole set of televisions from the 60s and 70s um, and you know, cars, automobiles, the consumer goods were uh, being exported. Um, and so many, some of us may remember seeing objects with the Made in Japan um, moniker on it, which, as we all know, eventually became uh, made in Korea or made in China, um, made in Taiwan. So the, those markets sort of moved over the decades. But Made in Japan was sort of a, a common phrase that we, many people were familiar with in the, in the mid 20th century. But in reality, exports represented only about 10% of the gross national product during this, this time period, the 60s and 70s. So in other words, that means that it was domestic consumers who were the most important force behind this rapid growth in the Japanese economy. That meant there, they had excess income, they could be um, going on vacations, they could maybe be picking up um, a new hobby. And so things like ikebana, traditional Japanese flower arranging, uh, and many, uh, you know, the Japanese government had whole offices devoted to encouraging um, leisure and, and encouraging travel, domestic travel in particular, but travel uh, in general. Um, Japan had already sort of, because of this economic boom, uh, Japan had already uh, cultivated sort of this workaholic um, it seemed to have a workaholic labor force and and that's something that is still sort of relevant today. But the Japanese government recognized that, it would be better for their citizens to um, engage in leisure activities and, and to find hobbies and not um, have that workaholic um, approach to life. So um, things like ikebana and um, golfing became sort of a, a new pastime as well. So these sorts of leisure activities were really on the rise in this era. But, and at the same time, there was a lot of cultural exchange between Japan and the United States, which makes sense because, um, because of the allied occupation, there was a lot of exposure in Japan to American culture. And then after the occupation, um, there were just still many, many economic and cultural ties. And, and so here in this slide, you see on the left, the mayor of Boston in the 1960s, um, attending a dedication ceremony uh, for a tea room that was um, gifted to the city by their sister city of Kyoto. 
Um, and then on the right, you can see um, the, the Japanese animated version of the Little House on the Prairie story. So Little House on the Prairie was a phenomenon, um, not only here in the United States, I'm sure many of us remember watching uh, the television show in the mid 70s and then well into the 80s as it went into syndication. That's when I was watching it. But uh, it also was a big hit in Japan. And the idea of the American pioneer really captured Japanese audience, uh, their, the Japanese audience's imagination. And um, so this, there was an animated version, but there was also, they also showed the American television show um, with Michael Landon and, and that whole cast um, just dubbed into Japanese and it was extremely popular. So these romantic ideas of the American West captured um, not just American um, imagination, but Japanese as well. Now, that's, these are all ways that I'm sort of setting the stage for um, then what happened in 1971, which was uh, that Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof, his wife, partner, um, had built a pieced quilt collection. They had begun this collection in the late 1960s, going out to flea markets and auctions in rural Pennsylvania. They sort of saw these, these quilts and were just, you know, sort of captivated by them and started collecting them when very few people were collecting American antique quilts. And um, in 1971, they uh, made a proposal to the Whitney Museum of American Art uh, of a American pieced, antique pieced quilt show. Um, and they took a little bit of convincing, but uh, they had sort of an opening in their summer schedule. Jonathan Holstein always talks about it as they, that he felt that the Whitney saw it as sort of a toss away show, just something uh, that they could fill a, a open slot with and that, um, you know, they would just sort of, it would pass and that would be it. Nobody would pay much attention. Now, that is obviously not what ended up happening. Um, people, visitors flocked to the exhibition. It was extraordinarily popular. It was the most well attended exhibition up to that date for the Whitney. Um, and perhaps most significantly, Hilton Kramer, the New York Times art critic, wrote a glowing review of the exhibition. Here's the, I have a reproduction here of his article titled Art Quilts Find a Place at the Whitney. And he, he had nothing but good things to say about the curators, about what the Whitney had done, and most especially about the quilts themselves. Um, so there were clearly parallels being drawn here, not only by Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof and the Whitney, but also by viewers and critics you know, drawing parallels between these antique quilts and contemporary art that was being seen in Manhattan, in New York, you know, in the cultural and artistic capitals of the world at the time. You know, minimalism, abstract, abstract expressionism, these were sort of the, um, the key modes of expression um, in the fine arts during the mid 20th century. And people started to see parallels between some of these um, block style patchwork quilts and the art that was really uh, so common and so popular at the time. Um, so the quilts, as I said, were a huge hit in New York. And as a result, they ended up traveling uh, around the United States, but also to Europe. Um, so on the right, you see a photograph of some of the quilts, some of the Holstein Vanderhoof quilts in Berlin, Germany. Um, in the middle is a brochure or a, a pamphlet from the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, England. Um, and on the left is a, is a clipping of Jonathan Holstein in front of some of their quilts at the High Museum in Atlanta. So there was just, this is just a small <laughs> a representation of the kinds of media coverage that the exhibition received here and abroad. Um, and in Japan, people started to take notice. Uh, this article was in the magazine Kurashi no Teko, which means sort of handbook for living. It's an article written by a young woman named Kazuko Yamakawa. Um, she actually saw the quilts when they were in Paris at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs. Um, and 
so she arranged to interview Jonathan Holstein and then this this glossy colorful article came out in Japan in 1972 and I think a lot of people took notice this is just a couple of pages from this multi page spread in a popular um, sort of design type magazine so I think this started to yeah, make some serious waves already in 1972 shortly after the Whitney show was over and as the quilts were traveling around the world and I as I was reading my colleague now Nomura she um, translated the article for us for me to read it in English and one of my favorite quotations from the uh, Kazuko Yamakawa interview was when she said quote my expectation for American collector and quilt collector did not match the young man in blue jeans standing in front of me um, I don't have any photographs of Jonathan Holstein or Gail Van Hoop in Paris, but we did in the archives have this photo of them at a Pennsylvania flea market, um, both of them wearing blue jeans. And so I just, I thought that was a very telling um, part of her interview that she, she was expecting obviously someone more formal, more perhaps older. Um, and here was this sort of young blue jean wearing guy uh, who was the one who you know, with his partner had collected all these beautiful quilts. So the media coverage in Japan certainly had an effect on the Japanese public. And um, one of the, or a few of the results of that newfound attention in Japan on American quilts was that uh, Jonathan and Gail received invitations, multiple invitations to travel their quilts to Japan. So these are some letters that um, you can see in the University of Nebraska archives and special collections um, the, the Jonathan Holstein collection there has all these wonderful documents um, that reveal the history of how this all happened. And oddly enough, um, the, the letter on the left and the letter on the right are both dated November 26, 1974. The one on the left is from the embassy, the US embassy. Um, and they wrote to Jonathan and Gail on behalf of the Kyoto Museum of Modern Art. They approached um, Holstein and Vanderhoof asking if they would be willing to send the quilts to the Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto. And then on the right is a letter from a, a representative of the Shiseido Company, so the, the large um, cosmetics company. Uh, they were actually founded in 1872, but in 1919, they established the Shiseido Gallery, which actually claims to be the oldest art gallery in Japan. So it's been um, ongoing since then, and they, they show um, really top-notch art from all over the world. Um, but so they had just opened a new gallery in Tokyo in the Ginza district, which is sort of the, the posh, the wealthy the shopping district in Tokyo. So they had just opened a new corporate headquarters and had a new Shiseido gallery and they really wanted something fantastic to sort of debut in their new gallery. So oddly enough, Holstein and Vanderhoof received these um, invitations on, on letterhead dated the same date in 1974. And they said yes to both of these. Um, so the middle letter is what uh, is from the actual Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto as a follow up to the invitation extended by the embassy. So the quilts did go. They went to Tokyo first, as I said, to the Ginza. Here's the brochure from American Pieced Quilts at the Shiseido Gallery in March of 1975. I love the designed brochure with its sort of uh, Victorian S clip art maybe this the gentleman in the top right i'm not sure how he fits into this whole scheme um, obviously the american flag on the bottom right is that fits very well but um and i also really liked that they included a photograph of jonathan and gail um, on the back of the brochure some of these quilts were ones that were shown at the whitney Museum of American Art in 1971, and others were ones they substituted in because they did continue to collect after the Whitney show ended. They, they added more and more quilts to their collection. So some of these, yes, were in the original abstract design in American quilts, and some were added on at this later date. 
So here are some installation photos at the Shiseido Gallery. Um, there are a lot of quilts in there. They really sort of fit them in rather tightly. I also liked, it's a little hard to tell, but on the left-hand photo, uh, there's that log cabin um, streak of lightning variation in gray and red, and it actually is cascading down sort of a multi-leveled platform. So it has a little bit of a avant-garde display element to it here, but it's, it's always fascinating to me to see these um, original installation photos. And I try to imagine myself in 1975 uh, in Tokyo going to one of these shows. I'm sure people were just really blown away by the quilts. Um, and a, a quotation uh, when I spoke with Jonathan last year about this exhibition specifically, uh, one that I really thought was very telling and um, again, made me wish I could have been there in 1975 is this, where he says, as I look back now on that first exhibition, among my fondest memories are the reactions of the Japanese women exclusively who came to see the quilts in the gallery on the Ginza. They got the whole thing immediately and saw absolutely no reason not to explore the quilts respectfully, but thoroughly examining how they had been pieced, tracing the quilting stitchery, turning them to inspect the backs. Many came back a number of times. When we saw their intense interest and the care approaching reverence with which they handled the quilts, we took down the please do not touch signs and let it happen. It was a lovely moment for us. So as a museum curator, of course, that you know sort of appalls me to one extent. <laughs> but on the other hand, I just think it's so wonderful um, that it was so clear, so apparent that the Japanese public uh, the, the women who were coming to view the, these quilts maybe multiple times were just so um, captured by them. They were so interested in them that they, they felt like they simply had to touch them. <laughs> so not only were the quilts on display, but Jonathan and Gail also sort of were part of a, a media blitz. They got to go on a, a very popular Japanese TV show uh, called Oshare, Stylish. Here are some shots of that. Um, I love this one where there's a quilt in the front. It's a sort of a log cabin courthouse steps variation quilt in the, the uh, foreground. And then this wonderful shot of Jonathan and Gail and the hosts of the show on this um, very 70s looking set. <laughs> so yeah, the, the uh, exhibition received a lot of attention in Japan and um, the quilts then the next year traveled on to Kyoto. Actually, they went to Kyoto in 1975 and were shown in some smaller venues, including the American Center in Kyoto. But the big show was for 1976. And the organizers very explicitly asked for the exhibition to open on July 4th, 1976. They understood that the bicentennial was a really big deal, of course, for Americans, but they wanted to be able to showcase some American folk art during that uh, big celebration in the United States. So um, American Quilts opened, as I said, on July, July 4th and ran through August 8th, 1976. And again, as I was going through the archival material at the University of Nebraska um, Archives and Special Collections, I loved finding these hand. I loved finding hand-drawn maps that Jonathan uh, Holstein had had put together, showing exactly how he wanted each exhibition uh, to to look. And I'm not sure what the numbering system exactly is, um, but he he very clearly knew where he wanted things to go. And on the left-hand drawing, you can see right in the center, it says platform puffs. So that's this quilt, <laughs> which I can see why he wanted it on a platform and not on a wall because it's, they are puffs. They are heavily stuffed um, sort of pouches of fabric that are then pieced together into this overall quilt or bed cover. Um, so it's just, it's fun, I think, to look at some of these drawings, including this one. Um, again, he has a very complex hand-drawn system here showing exactly which quilts he wants. He has little nicknames for some of them. Uh, Puffs, again, is up in the upper right there. 
Uh, this one is uh, one of the more famous pieces from the original Abstract Design in American Quilts exhibition at the Whitney. And I love that he calls it Nine Patch Mondrian. Um, so it's, of course, he's, he's referencing Pete Mondrian, the early 20th century abstract artist who um, eventually, although he started with naturalistic drawing and painting, he sort of distilled all forms down into grids. Um, so I'm sure many, most of us are familiar with his artwork and I can see exactly why uh, Holstein labeled it this way. Those red squares really sort of um, create sort of different levels of um, visual levels, the same way that Mondrian's work does. This is another one, another famous piece from the Whitney exhibition. He calls it Mass Saw, <laughs> which I think is, is a great little shorthand label for it. It's a sawtooth quilt. And then, as I said, he added, he and Gail added in some quilts that weren't in the original Whitney exhibition. This is an example of a piece that they had added to their collection uh, after 1971, but they wanted to include it in this Japanese version of the exhibition. So tulips got included uh, in their show. So the exhibition, um, as I, I, I have been sort of saying all along, but um, it was just a huge hit. It was, uh, it, everybody loved it. And as the director of the American Center in Kyoto wrote in a letter to John and Gail, he said, the show was a smash everywhere it went. So that pretty succinctly um, says exactly how successful the, the exhibition was. At the American Center, as I said, a small version of the exhibition was shown at the American Center um, just for eight days. But you know, 1,600 people came. Then during the major event at the Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, um, in really just a month, they had 16,000 people come to see the quilts. Uh, the quilts also went to Fukuoka and Sapporo with another several thousand people seeing those. Um, the exhibition was covered by pretty much every major newspaper in Japan, the art journals, and then also TV coverage by NHK, which is the main sort of like public television uh, channel in Japan. So it was just, uh, it made huge waves in Japan, and which obviously means that people had to take notice. So here are some of the clippings. Again, these are items you can find in the UNL archives. I do not speak Japanese. Um, so unfortunately, I can't read all of these articles myself. Um, I do read, I can read a little bit of kanji, but uh, you can just tell, even without reading, being able to read them, you can tell sort of how um, flattering and excited the, the publications were about these American quilts being on view in Japanese cities. Um, so there was media coverage, but then also um, like, for instance, uh, this book was published shortly thereafter at the end of 1976. And it was a sort of a, a glossy illustrated book, but it also had a how to section at the end. Um, so I, I think a lot of people who were thinking about quilts and were interested in them probably picked up this book and um, it, this could, could very well have been the gateway or the entryway for many, Jap you know, sort of nascent Japanese quilt makers. In fact, um, a, a quilt maker who I'll be talking about in just a few minutes who participated in our Journey to Japan exhibition, Emiko Todalo, this is what she had to say about the Holstein and Vanderhoof quilts. She says, in 1976, I saw the exhibition, but did not know that it was the Holstein Vanderhoof collection. A year before that, I had traveled abroad for the first time and met my future husband, a New Yorker, and became interested in America. I remember that I went to see the exhibition because it was a great opportunity to see real American quilts. I still remember the coffee cup quilt. The quilt had a sense of bygone times and I felt very warm, even nostalgic, thinking about the American past that I never knew. And I just love that. Um, the, that is, this is a reproduction here uh, in the book. 
they reproduced the coffee cups book in order to be able to give people directions on how to make their own version of it. But this is the one she saw. Um, and again, it sort of speaks to that idea of many um, people who's, you know, Japanese people who saw this media coverage latching onto that the idea of the romanticized American past and the, and the role that quilts um, play in that romanticized past. So thinking about 1975, 1976 and beyond the impact, you know, it was, it was huge, I think. Um, this is a photograph of uh, a quilt making class um, run by the Japan Handicraft Instructors Association. And they were an organization that had already been founded in uh, the 1960s, but starting in 1986, so a few decades um, or a decade or so after the quilts had actually gone to Japan, they started a, a quilt certification course, which is still going strong today. So this is a, a class illustrating um, a teacher um, instructing students in quilt making. And I think that's largely came out of, or at least was partially influenced by this sort of flurry of act, quilt related activity that was happening in the mid and late 70s. Another impact um, is on collectors. And this is a photograph of Robert and artist James, who were the uh, original benefactors of the International Quilt Museum, who donated their collection in 1997. That really gave our institution a start. The, its start. And they're here at World Quilt 98, which was a, an exhibition put on by Mr. Tadanobu Seto, who was the founder of the Japan Handicraft Instructors Association, and uh, as well as Jonathan Holstein. So um, I think Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoof's um, exhibitions in New York, but then also in uh, around the US and in Europe, but then specifically in Japan, I think there were just all of these ripple effects, including influencing other collectors um, who saw, oh, okay, collecting American quilts, that's, that's a thing. Um, there are now dealers we can go to who will help us find quilts to add to our collection. So there was just this momentum, um, both here in the US, but also abroad. And we, I think we're still feeling some of those effects today. Uh, here are some photos of activities that uh, have taken place here at the International Quilt Museum. And on the left hand side, unfortunately, um, largely due to COVID, at least partially due to COVID, we haven't been able to host uh, a Japan Handicraft Instructors Association uh, group for, for several years now. But for many years, we had groups of Japanese quilt makers come uh, for many days, for several days, and learn about quilts. Uh, from our collection and then also get you know take classes with local and national quilt artists so that's something that um, I think is again a, a, a perhaps indirect influence or result of those quilts going to Japan in the 70s and we've also featured several exhibitions by Japanese quilt makers and that is what I want to turn to for the final portion of my talk today, and that is some of these sort of key players in, uh, in Japanese quilt making. And many of the people who we asked to be involved in the Journey to Japan exhibition, most of them were aware of the Holstein Vanderhoof collection. They were aware of the quilts that went to Japan in, in the mid 1970s. Many of them also saw the quilts, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in that quotation from Emiko Toda Loeb, whose quilts you actually see here on the bottom of this screen. Yeah, many of them did actually go see the quilts either in Kyoto or Tokyo. So um, the people we talked to and invited to be part of this exhibition, um, I think they were um, sort of part of this larger story of the journey to Japan. And what this specific project looked like was that we asked each artist to select a quilt from the uh, original group of abstract design in American quilts, um, quilts, the quilts that were at the Whitney Museum of American Art. We asked them to select one and then reinterpret it 
um, make, make it, use it as, a, as, as inspiration for making their own quilt. So I just wanna share those quilts with you here. Um, Kumiko Fujita, she was actually trained as a graphic designer, but she says that um, discovering, she saw um, a magazine article in 1975 about the Holstein and Vanderhoof collection. She didn't actually get to go see them in person, but she saw one of the articles and she says um, that discovering early American quilts was life-changing for me. And it influenced me to make a transition from graphic design to the quilt world. And I think you can really see um, her graphic design training quite clearly in her quilt, her, her version of the schoolhouse quilt here, um, this spare color palette, the black, white, and red, um, and, and sort of the very precise patchwork or piecing and quilting, um, but it still has a very lively spirit to it that I think is similar uh, to the original antique. And here are some, here's a detail of one of the school children. You can see she does machine quilting and machine piecing. Here's another detail. Again, very crisp, clean lines, uh, very much a graphic designer at, at her core, I think. The next key player I wanted to show is Keiko Koke. Um, she's a very well-known Japanese quilter and quilt teacher. Um, she said she, be, she began quilt making about 50 years ago and she originally focused on what she called uh, picture quilts uh, with figurative applique. Uh, but later she embraced doing more sort of traditional piece patterns, but she didn't wanna make them in the standard way. She only wanted to approach them extemporaneously, uh, you know, without any templates. She would cut and place the hand dyed fabrics sort of directly and impro improvisationally as she worked. And you can see here, so she was referencing a Rob Peter to Pay Paul quilt, but her version sort of breaks that whole pattern apart into, you know, uh, more loose and freeform shapes. She does a lot of heavy machine quilting here that you can see. That adds, you know, a lot, a lot of texture. Uh, the next artist who participated in Journey to Japan is Shoko Hatano, who has shown at Quilt National. Um, she's very well known both in Japan and the US. I love her version of this crazy quilt. I think she just does such a fantastic job of she references the colors. She also references the fact that the crazy quilt is both crazy but contained at the same time because each of the crazy blocks is very much a block. It's uh, a contained system of crazies. <laughs> and she does sort of the same thing. She's got a grid. She references a grid there, but then her, uh, her fabrics sort of break out of that grid. So um, she is well known for um, sort of a, almost a calligraphic look. She does some painting and brush strokes on her fabrics before she includes them into her quilt. Um, the, the, the use of these shiny fabrics also, I think, really brings her, her quilts to life. Um, I just think she did such a fantastic job. And the next piece is by Yoshiko Katagiri, another just really well known. She was the first winner of the Quilt Nihon competition, which um, began in the late 80s and is still ongoing uh, every other year. There's a competition, an international um, a juried competition and she was the very first winner. This is her version of this log cabin quilt. Um, and it's hard, it might be hard to tell, but there are log cabin blocks in there. She uh, created a jellyfish motif using log cabin blocks and then incorporated them. She didn't simply just lay them over, but she incorporated them into her log cabin grid. So it's a, it's a complex system uh, that she was using, a com complex technique. Um, and her inspiration for this quilt and specifically for the name, she calls it mother. Um, and then a, sort of a subtitle is la mer and la mer means the sea. Um, and her title, the meaning of that is that the kanji or the Japanese character for sea it contains both the kanji for 
it contains the kanji for mother within it. So the word for C also has the word mother in it in the Japanese um, ideogram system. And she really liked that because she felt like uh, the Holstein Vanderhoof collection was the mother of Japanese quilt culture. So she loved that there was sort of this play on words in her, in her title. So here again are some, there are the, there's the jellyfish tentacles streaming down. The next artist is Harue Konishi. And again, she does a brilliant job of referencing this very plain and simple bars quilt, red and white bars quilt. Uh, and the, her version is very much in her style of uh, these sort of wonky uh, little blocks with almost an L shape on them. She uses antique kimono fabrics. And this one actually, these are um, primarily pre-World War II kimono. The, the red is from a, an embroidered uh, wedding kimono. And then the white fabric is from a, one of her mother-in-law's kimono. So um, she's using fabric that means a lot to her, but you can see how intensively the stitching, the quilting stitching is on her work. It just makes for such a, a wonderful surface. And there's another detail, all machine quilted. Uh, Suzuko Koseki was another participant in Journey to Japan. She was referencing this string squares quilt and she loves using, she, she loves doing string piecing and she, but even more, she loves using fabrics with words printed on them. And I love how some of them come together in interesting ways, striped dress. The words there are, I think, quite appropriate since these um, it's string piecing, lots of little stripes. I also like how she included sort of a remnant of lace or crochet, I guess that is, from maybe from a, a doily or something like that, but she recycled it and included it on her piece. And here's lots more words. Some of these are perhaps antique seed or sugar sacks, but a lot of them are just newer commercial fabrics that she brings together. Um, and Shizuko Kuroha, again, does such a brilliant job of taking the original quilt and making it her own. This is very much in her style, using lots of small pieces um, brought together and using indigo, traditional Japanese indigo dyed fabrics. But I love that she, in the bottom left corner, she has a, a little block that sort of pops in the same way or visually um, advances in the same way those red squares do in the original. Here are some details. You can see there's some um, kanji characters written on there in some way, um, some ink remnants on those antique fabrics. And there's that little square at the bottom left. Um, we, then I, I have just um, three more artists. This is Emiko Todalo. And she referenced the kaleidoscope quilt. And she did such a great job of taking these black fabrics, but she pieces them together and uses them in such a way that you, they are distinguished from each other. You would think that using black on black um, wouldn't be all that successful, but she does such a great job with it. And she actually references several of the Holstein Vanderhoof quilts in her collection. Eiko Okano made this uchikake, which is a wedding shape, uh, a wedding kimono shaped quilt. And this is in her series called It's a Beautiful Day. This one is It's a Beautiful Day, volume six. And we are very happy to have uh, several other quilts in her It's a Beautiful Day series in our collection. And again, um, referencing that uh, log cabin straight furrow setting using Japanese fabrics. Um, she does such a great job. And here are a couple of details. And finally, our last artist, who I always like ending with because um, it's such a great, wonderful, exuberant piece. She references the uh, rainbow stripes quilt that was actually on the cover of the original Whitney Museum of American Art catalog that they produced for abstract design in American quilts. She just takes that and like sort of explodes those rainbows lots of tiny little pieces, these sort of swooping arabesques across the surface. And I love what she says about this quilt. She told me, and now 
the year 2020 is in a state of emergency because of the coronavirus disease. With what's going on right now, I worked with the theme of rainbow in order to express my hope for the return of dreams, happy and fulfilling lives, and fun. So I love, I love her, um, her emotion, her expression uh, of hope that she has uh, in this embedded in her quilt. So that is uh, the journey to Japan. I hope I've given you an interesting overview. If you would like to learn more about Japanese quilts and the and the specifically 20th century quilt making history, here are a few books you might want to see: the classic Jill Liddell and Yuko Watanabe book, Japanese quilts. Um, Teresa Durie Wong just a few years ago put out a fabulous um, book uh, called Japanese Contemporary Quilts and Quilters. And then now my colleague has an article in Uncoverings um, from the American Quilt Study Group. In addition, in August, we'll be launching a new module in our World Quilts uh, website series. Um, so it will be going live next month and it will be all about uh, what was going on in 1971 and afterwards. So it's, uh, it's the theme is uh, the abstract design in American quilts exhibition, but then it, it sort of ripples out uh, from there. So you can learn a lot more about all of these various topics, including the journey to Japan. And I would just like to make a special thanks to the UNL archives and special collections for all those great documents I was able to include, as well as Jonathan Holstein and then some other folks who have helped support our programming and our exhibition. And I think to close out before we, I don't know if we have enough time for any questions. I, I went up right to the minute, but we want to thank our sponsors again, Moda, Fabrics, uh, Quilting Daily, eQuilter.com, Aurafil, Art, Artistic Artifacts, Misty Fuse, Schiffer Publishing, Clover, Nine Patch Fabrics, uh, Thai Silks, Empty Spool Seminars, Quilt Mania, and thequiltshow.com. Um, so that is Journey to Japan. I hope you enjoyed learning about this topic and I would be happy to answer any questions we can fit in in the last minute or two we have available to us. Yes, um, well, we're receiving a lot of great comments, Marin, uh, complimenting what you shared with us today. And uh, there was an earlier question I answered, which was, are the quilts in the IQM collection? What would you say, Marin? Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you answered that. But yes, we are so thrilled to have the Journey to Japan quilts as part of our collection. It was a project that we embarked on with the help of the Robert and Ernest James Foundation. Um, so that allowed us to actually acquire those quilts from the artists. So they will stay in our collection now permanently. That's great. Um, there's a quite a couple of questions about the transcript and the, the uh, captioning that I'm not able to answer. I'm unfortunately, um, if Lucy is available to answer, is there a way to save this transcript? Oh, uh, there should be a way to save it in your settings, but if you can't get it saved, just send me an email at info at sakwa.com. So S-A-Q-A dot com, and I will send you the transcript. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, well, there don't seem to be any further questions showing up in the Q&A. Um, so maybe I'll just assume that you have um, um, answered everything in what you prepared to share, Marin, and prepared and shared with us. So we do, um, we do want to thank you for this. We appreciate our sponsors. Uh, there's one last question. Uh, will this be on YouTube? Yes, it will be coming on YouTube. On, uh, I believe this one will be on our channel. Is that right? Uh, it will be on our channel, but I believe it will also be on other sponsor channels as well. And maybe Lucy can answer that for sure, but I know that we will have it on our YouTube channel. Uh, yes, this will be up on the International Quilt Museum's YouTube channel, and you can probably find it if you just search Textile Talks Journey to Japan on YouTube uh, in the next few days. Thank you.
All right. Well, I think we will uh, say goodbye for today and um, um, wish you all a great afternoon. And until next week for the next Textile Talk. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.